example, if we look at earthquake risk management, then uh, obviously it has to be science and knowledge based. It cannot be on the basis of perception. Uh, it must be on the basis of knowledge and backed by good science. And it should take into account, obviously, the present ground realities. Uh, one of the ground realities is uh, the ability to, uh, to get the information accurately and in time. Then the future growth trajectory, this is uh, important because there's a linkage between uh, disasters and the impact on economy and impact on the people's well-being, which goes far beyond the people who are directly affected by the disaster. And lastly, the aspirations of the at-risk people, uh, the, uh, the threshold of uh, people's ability to absorb disasters or losses changes with place and also changes with time. So disaster risk management has to take this into account in order to be effective. Then obviously the risk management uh, has to be uh, compliant with the relevant laws and rules, should conform to international standards. We are now a major international player. We cannot take steps which make us into a laughing stock. Uh, we need to stand up to our reputation and our prestige. Uh, it should take into account governance and institutional capacity. And these are obviously locally owned, so they have to be at the local level. And then the strategy should be implementable and sustainable so that they can be mainstreamed. So if I look at earthquake risk, uh, the information which are needed in order to do risk management, uh, first of all is that uh, we need the information on hazard, the very first box on the top. And uh, this uh, essentially tells you about the strength of ground shaking. Uh, then we need information about vulnerability. What is the impact of their ground shaking? And this is primarily the impact on structures because it's the structure damage or, or, the, or the shaking of the structure which results in the adverse consequences. And then we need information about the exposure. So if structures are damaged, then what is the impact of that damage? There may be direct losses in terms of, uh, say, the repair cost and so on. There may be indirect losses, factories being shut down, government departments being closed, hospitals not able to treat patients and so on. And in every case of the, of the losses, there would be a social loss, the number of casualties or the number of people affected and so on, or the number of government departments which have become uh, dysfunctional, and the financial loss, which is more in terms of the repair and the restoration cost. And all of them together will give us risk. So when we do risk management, basically uh, in all those three rectangles, we can take steps to reduce the consequences. And it is not that uh, there's a linear process that we can we have to do one before we do the other. Simultaneously, we can tackle uh, initiatives in all three of these boxes. So if I look at the hazard, uh, then it can be uh, the understanding of the hazard can be based on the knowledge of past earthquakes. It can be based on understanding of the current seismic activities. And uh, my previous speaker had just given uh, a, a very good uh, summary of what is currently happening in the country on this. And it can also combine uh, the current understanding as well as the historical knowledge to get a better understanding of the hazard. The vulnerability depends on the type of building stocks and their specific vulnerability, how strong are each of these building stocks. Depends on things like material of construction, architectural features of the buildings, the structural systems, a number of technical things. Then exposure, uh, both the impact and resilience, so the ability of the people to absorb losses can be incorporated. And uh, we typically consider both the social or the human losses as well as the financial losses when we are looking at exposure. Uh, one of the things about exposure is that by understanding exposure, various government agencies, various departments, various other non-government stakeholders, they can assess their ability to fulfill their expected responsibilities in the event of a disaster. So uh, to, take it, to take one example, so let us say there is a particular kind of event which occurs uh, somewhere near Delhi and which affects Delhi badly. Uh, so we, uh, th this particular step over here, uh, we can have the hospitals look at their ability to continue to function if the event occurs. So are they of the strength and are they of the kind of uh, equipments which they use that they will be undamaged or will they be slightly damaged or will they be significantly damaged? 
So they can assess these things in advance and then decide whether they need to take some remedial measures or not. Then also particularly relevant for government departments is that uh, they can use this information to assess the effectiveness of their risk management measures. So uh, if a particular ministry is disaster management plan, is it geared to be able to continue to function uh, when this kind of an earthquake occurs? Uh, so we have had many examples in the past uh, in India and also in other countries where after a major earthquake, uh, the ability of the government to uh, effectively manage in the short term was badly impeded because the government officers were busy taking care of the needs of their own families and their own communities. And these are very, very real conflict between the need to manage the uh, casualties within the family and the need to manage the responsibility imposed as a government servant. And there is no clear answer on how to manage these things. So obviously uh, having this understanding beforehand and then planning for it is useful. And, and another thing is that uh, earthquakes cannot be managed by just one or two government departments. It has to involve many, many stakeholders together. So it requires coordination between the stakeholders. And that would also require understanding whether the coordination is functional or not. And this can also be done by understanding the exposure step. So all of these can be done and are being done uh, to various levels of uh, efficiency in, uh, in state governments and in central government. So uh, earthquake risk will combine hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. And uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is that uh, risk can change, change with time and does change with time. So one of the things we changes with time is the people's, uh, what you can call as the risk threshold. Uh, as India becomes more and more, uh, uh, say, economically advanced, uh, people's uh, acceptance of uh, risk reduces. And this is not just in India, that this is something which happens in all the countries. And because of that, the uh, risk management uh, uh, strategies which have to be, uh, 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 to be implemented also has to gear up to meet the people's expectations. And uh, one of the most uh, useful way in which these can be done uh, is uh, through developing scenarios of earthquake events. So uh, take uh, scientifically valid and based on very clear scientific uh, information, uh, a certain earthquake event and map out what is the consequence of the earthquake everywhere. And it provides a lot of useful information. For example, we are able to de-aggregate the risk, which means that we are able to find out how much of the risk is because of the strength of shaking, how much of the risk is because of the impact of the shaking on different kinds of buildings, how much of that is because of the institutional setup of different government departments and so on. And also we can see what is required to manage, where are the resources available for that? And obviously resources are never sufficient. So then how do we prioritize? And these things can be done in advance and planned. And one thing I would like to caution is that simplistic risk management approach is really effective. I mean, this has been shown in the country time and time again. It has been shown in other countries also. That if you feel that common sense is what is going to save us from the adverse effects of an earthquake, then unfortunately, so far, we have not even have a single evidence of that being true. So uh, this is showing uh, the earthquakes uh, which have occurred in and around India for during the last 100 years. Uh, there was another similar figure shown earlier. And what you can see is that pretty much no part of the country uh, is untouched from the shaking of an earthquake. Uh, so the dots represent the epicenters, uh, but obviously the shaking is uh, also experienced far away from the dot. So no, I mean, it doesn't matter where you are in the country, you cannot say that earthquake is not something which I should uh, take care of. Uh, obviously, earthquake uh, risk management is required all over the country. Uh, uh, this is an interesting study which showed uh, what are known as the seismic gaps in the Himalayas. Uh, so in the Himalayan region, which are known to have very large earthquakes occurring periodically, there are certain areas where earthquakes have not occurred in the last few hundred years. And there's a hypothesis that these are the areas where a large earthquake may occur soon in the near future. And, uh, and why it is important is that uh, if those earthquakes occur, then uh, the region around these gaps where the shaking would be very strong, those are the areas where the earthquake risk management effort has to be uh, particularly taken care of. 
So I will show you the scenario of a magnitude 8 earthquake in one of those gaps. And it's actually a, a recurrence of an earthquake which had occurred in 1905. So known as a Mundi earthquake. And, uh, and it is occurring in a seismic gap uh, where a very large earthquake has not occurred uh, in the recent past. So, so if I go back to this, you can see that there is a black dot on the top showing 1905. This is a Kangra earthquake. And uh, just to the right of it, uh, there is a gap, a white one, where an earthquake has not occurred for nearly 600 years. So if the 1905 earthquake approximately reoccurs, and there's no reason why it cannot reoccur, uh, can reoccur in this gap, which is an extension of the same uh, same fault area, same fault planes, then what would be the consequence? So this is showing the area in uh, closer. There are a lot of lines being shown in blue. Those are the seismic faults in the region. Uh, there is a, a dot showing Kangra. There's another dot showing Shimla. And the location of the earthquake is being shown by a star. And Chandigarh also you can see in this uh, in this map. And this is a, 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 a another picture again, uh, removing the other seismic faults, only showing the uh, fault which has ruptured. You can see a blue line. Uh, the blue line represents the length of the fault where there is a movement which takes place when this magnitude eighth earthquake would occur. And again, you can see all the districts. Uh, the districts to be affected belong to Himachal Pradesh, Punjab, Haryana, and also partly in Uttarakhand and partly in Jammu and Kashmir. And the Union territory of uh, Chandigarh is also uh, within the strong shaking area. This is again showing the faults with the further close up. Many of you are from this part of the country. I saw in the blogs, lots of people are from uh, from this part. So you can more closely locate to where you are on the basis of this uh, hypothetical earthquake. So uh, this is again showing the uh, a, a cleaner image that uh, if you have the rupture, then the rupture corresponds to the blue line. So you may have a very strong shaking even far away from epicenter because the earthquake rupture may be very close to you even though the epicenter is not that close. So for example, Monday district is likely to be badly affected in this particular hypothetical earthquake because of the fact that the rupture extends all the way up to Monday, even though the epicenter was far away. So uh, how do we assess damage? Uh, the way we, uh, Indian uh, uh, decision to assess damage is through what is known as the earthquake intensity divided into uh, 12 intensities from 1 to 12. 12 is the strongest earthquake intensity where there would be large scale landscape changes. 11 is where there is large scale destruction, including very, very large cracks in the ground and so on. And then uh, 10 is when most of the well built buildings will suffer irreparable damage. So even if they don't collapse, they cannot be repaired. Uh, nine corresponds to uh, well-built buildings suffering extensive damage. So obviously buildings which are not well-built would be performing much worse than this. Uh, eight would be when uh, most of the well-built buildings will suffer damage, but uh, not so much collapse. Seven corresponds to damage to buildings where many of the buildings uh, will suffer moderate damage. A major damage would be only a few. And then you go to lower and lower intensity of damage. And in this particular uh, earthquake scenario, now I'm showing you contour maps with different colors. The darker the color, the stronger in the, is the damage intensity. And what you can see is that near the epicenter and the surrounding area, the damage intensity is somewhere around 9 to 10, which means that even well-built buildings, which are complying with the Indian standards, are likely to be badly damaged or almost on the threshold of collapse. And then the next outer uh, ring is the damage intensity eight to nine, which represents uh, well-built buildings suffering extensive damage uh, or major damage. And then further out, as you move further and further away, the extent of damage gets, uh, gets less and less. But, uh, but what is important over here is to see and realize that, uh, uh, that there are regions where the damage is going to be so intense that uh, even if the building is well built, it is likely to be uh, experiencing major damage. So which means the use of those buildings are not likely to be available unless those buildings are repaired in the months or years to come. And that is for the well built buildings. So the lesser built buildings would suffer even more damage. 
So this kind of information just on the shaking itself is not giving enough uh, enough really information to the government departments to decide what to do. And that is why those other steps become important. So in the case of uh, uh, this earthquake, for example, the area of area of the different shaking I have shown over here, Himachal Pradesh I have shown separately on the right because this epicenter, this hypothetical epicenter has been taken in HP. But you can see that Punjab, uh, Haryana, Himachal and Chandigarh together, what is the area in square kilometers for each of those damaged regions. And we can actually map out the population on it. So this is the population density as per the 2011 census. And you can see that uh, those black contour lines were those damage intensities of 9, 10, 8, 9, and so on. And you can see that uh, there are many areas which have very high population density, which are in the very strong shaking region. And if you look at the population, so, uh, so 23 uh, so two, 2 million people or 2.3 crore people are residing in, uh, in the intensity 9 to 10. So these are the areas where a large fraction of the buildings are going to be severely damaged. Now this starts providing information on, uh, on what the government should be doing or what the uh, other people, what the people should be doing to save themselves, for example. So what we are seeing is that a large earthquake can cause a major disaster as it adversely affects impact, uh, adversely impacts the people, their built environment and the region at large. And the risk uh, management, it considers the impact of the event in terms of the potential damage and losses before they have occurred. And what we have to keep in mind is that disaster risk management can only be effective if the risk in terms of damage and loss is understood before attempting to manage it. If we just understand the shaking, for example, that may not create uh, enough uh, momentum to decide uh, where to spend how much money in managing it. Uh, we, it's a very important step to understand the shaking and then we have to use it to move forward and also overlay the other information which we need. Uh, so scientifically rigorous scenario helps to make the disaster believable. believable and uh, this is required for active participation of the stakeholder agencies. Uh, so, so there have been many cases uh, in the past where uh, there have been PILs and the government has uh, answered saying that they need credible information in order to do budget budgeting. And cr credible information requires that they need to know what are the consequences and where how much money has to be spent. And, and those are valuable and valid needs of governance. So the disaster risk management strategy has to be able to support that. And that basically requires the agencies should be able to understand the specific uh, causes which lead to various consequences. And unless they are able to understand that, it becomes very difficult for them to act on it. And this kind of a scenario development project, we believe, uh, so this one which I have shown was taken up by the National Disaster Management Authority in partnership with IIT Bombay some time ago. And uh, this kind of a, of a development plan should be taken up uh, all over the country, particularly in areas which are highly prone to large earthquakes as part of long-term mitigation programs. And uh, the information which you get out of this actually uh, have been used and in future can be used for uh, various programs of the government departments for risk mitigation, for risk reduction, for preparedness of residual risk. So after you have carried out the mitigation and reduction, you cannot 100% eliminate the risk. So you still have to manage the residual risk to decide on the size and the capabilities of the search and rescue systems for on the response systems in terms of say emergency response, emergency shelter, emergency medical requirement, and so on. So all of them can be mapped to scenarios on the basis